don't mind me, I'm just gonna make my logo. Close enough, I guess. I think I've always had a feeling of indifference towards Destroy All Humans. I thought I had maybe played it when it originally released in 2005, but I couldn't be too sure as I didn't have any recollections of it. And I know for a fact I didn't play its sequels, so I can't describe myself as a fan. But as while well, playing the current remake during an early level when I was defending myself from attacking police at a drive-in theater, that a rush of memories flooded my mind. Reminders of me sitting in my fourth childhood home playing Destroy All Humans on my Xbox, and the nostalgia hit hard. Almost as if I had taken a drag from some magical drug, and it brought me back to a simpler and arguably more creative era of gaming. I was 15 or 16 year old me, just preparing to move to my fifth home, being taken in by the titles Telekinetic Physics and Destructibility, enjoying a game that while dated now, was a gem of the past. And it's that nostalgic reminiscencing that allowed me to fall in love with its 2020 remake, Issues and All. Destroy All Humans follows Cryptosporidium 137, an alien from a species known as the Fearon who travels to Orth Orth? Who travels to Earth with Orthopox 13 to find and hopefully save a downed ally, wittingly named Cryptosporidium 136. The latter was originally sent to this planet to harvest the brainstems of humans as they contain Furon DNA, a resource the alien species requires to thrive. It's while on the planet that 137 is handed the same mission, and so begins the game. You the player are on Earth to terrorize the humans, find your clone, and to take down a black op government agency known as Majestic. It's immediately made known that this game is one of dark humor, political satire, and as the name on the tin reads, destruction, of which you will destroy a lot. Crypto can traverse the game's six levels on foot or in his flying saucer, to which with the saucer there's a variety of weapons that can be unlocked and upgraded which allow the player to more easily demolish buildings and the like. There's a death ray which is its main weapon and it ignites fires, blows up buildings and vehicles, and plows through the ground. I especially enjoyed that last point as it made for a great visual to see the ground get torn up, as if I'd just had some epic anime battle with Goku or something. It was that level of immersion I didn't expect, and I welcomed the surprise. Along with the death ray, the ship has sonic boom capabilities, and abducto ray, and a quantum deconstructor, which works like a small nuke. There's also shields which can be too easily regenerated by absorbing the power of vehicles, and a repulsotron that was almost never necessary. This due to how easily shields can be regenerated. When timed correctly, it's supposed to blow up missiles before they hit, but I often just ignored it knowing I could tap triangle above a car and refill most of my ship's health. There is one ability that Crypto can use whether on ground or in his ship, and that's called the Transmogrifier. Weird name aside, all this does is convert items into fresh ammo, morphing them in a black hole-esque looking thing. The effect looks kinda neat, actually. It's in Crypto's ground game where the most options exist. There's a cortex scan that is mostly used during missions to discover info, and there's a few other brainwashing commands at your disposal, all of which are quickly accessible through the D-pad, though these were rarely used or needed. I actually made it through the entire game without using the distract option, as I had even forgotten it exists, so there's that. You won't need it. Outside of weapons, which I'll get to in a second, the most used tool is the Hollow Bob, and this allows you to change into any NPC in the game world. And due to a limited and repetitive mission structure, this was used very often. Too much so, if I'm being honest. But that aside, by far my favorite aspect of Destroy All Humans is its weaponry. There's a Zappomatic that shocks people with a cartoonishly excellent animation, though my two favorites were the Disintegrator Ray and Ion Detonator. The former burns people alive, only to eventually leave them as nothing but a standing skeleton, and the Ion Detonator, once properly upgraded, has its own gravity which pulls in people before vaporizing them in an ionic blast. There is also an anal probe, which sounds great in theory, I mean who doesn't want a nice anal probing, but its execution put me off. I actually stopped using it entirely, except in instances where it was required, which wasn't often at all. In my experience, it just felt clunky. 
On top of its clunkiness, it's a bit slower to use compared to other weapons, and by the end game you're being swarmed by so many respawning enemies, it just became more effort than it was worth. I guess I'll have to get my anal probing somewhere else. Outside of weapons, Crypto has other abilities to wreak havoc. He can suck people's brains from their skulls, which happens with a really satisfying pop. He can skate around and fly with a jetpack, all fun things in their own right, but they don't come anywhere close to what is by far the best ability, aka Psychokinesis. No matter the game, it's always satisfying to pick up objects with your mind, and as expected, it was enjoyable throwing cows or mailboxes or later on even cars at other people. Similar to some other aspects of the game, there was once again some clunkiness, this time around because getting the exact objects you wanted, it wouldn't always work, an issue that cropped up the most during time trials that required precision. But the issue wasn't game breaking, just annoying at times. With so many powers at your disposal, perhaps the most disappointing part of the game is its mission structure. It's very repetitive, and there's not a lot of variety, and I can't help but wonder if they could have utilized the powers in a more creative manner. But even as I say this, it's still hard to criticize that aspect too much given while this is releasing in current year. It's essentially just a fancy reskin of a 2005 game, and I can't in good conscience criticize something from 15 years ago for being dated by today's standard. I actually think it's commendable that the devs stay true to the original and didn't change much of its structure. From as far as I can tell, this is what fans wanted, and so they'll be pleased. For newcomers, if you temper expectations, I think you'll still get something from this game too. It's a great one to zone out to. And hey, who these days doesn't want to destroy all humans? Speaking of zoning out, the game is largely easy, except for a few areas towards the end. Combat can become chaotic, especially when stronger enemies are thrown your way like majestic agents with alien tech, walking tanks, rolling tanks, or mutant humans with their own special powers. But as long as the player doesn't get swarmed, things aren't too bad. Each mission also has secondary objectives, and chasing a small few of these can throw a wrench into things, but the majority of these are easy. Perhaps due to some of its ease, the title isn't too long. There are 6 areas and 22 missions, each area can also be free roamed, and while free roaming there's various activities to compete in. These are races, rampages, abduction challenges, and something called Armageddon. The goal is to 3 star each one, and it's chasing the 3 stars where the game becomes the most difficult. Well, sort of. Honestly, like most everything else, most of the challenges won't pose much of a, well, challenge at all, but the final race in the game was actually quite tough. It took more tries than I'd like to admit, and it was while completing this final one that I found a new annoyance with the game. Every time a challenge is completed, time slows down, and the same repetitive voice lines chime through, and it takes a good bunch of seconds to be able to hit replay, which also comes with its own loading screens, and when trying to replay something to 3 star challenge, it made the entire thing a hassle. It needs to be more streamlined. But outside of that, the only other challenge that took more than 2 or 3 tries was an abduction challenge that required me to get military resources, and with so many items stacked on top of one another, the game's finicky nature with precision telekinesis became a hassle. I'd aim at one thing only for something else to get picked up, and when battling the clock this got a tad annoying. Ultimately though, it was only momentarily, and by the end of the game I had 3 starred every single challenge. The only objective I didn't complete was finding all the collectibles. I 100%ed half the levels, but for the final 3 I just stopped caring about finding the hidden probes. For one, besides extra DNA, they don't seem to do much, and by the end of the game I had unlocked every upgrade, so more DNA was pointless. In general, I'm just so very tired of scouring environments for useless collectibles in gaming, so I gave up the chase. Thank fuck they weren't tied to trophies, which by the way, as I do with most of my reviews, I made sure to platinum this title, so needless to say, I experienced and completed everything, minus those darn collectibles. And yes, that is another platinum humble brag. welcome to my channel bitches. On a technical level, the game is fine. There's some poppin' issues here and there, and a couple animations, and I'm really sorry to use this word again, but a few animations are clunky, if not a little stilted. But on an artistic level, I like the cartoonish depiction of the 50s. Each area looks nice too, and the vibrant use of each color with an almost postcard aesthetic was pleasing to see. If there's one major qualm, it's the audio. I actually had to turn it off at times because it became really fucking annoying. NPCs only have so many canned lines, and holy shit do they repeat them all the frickin' time. If you're free roaming, do yourself a favor, 
and turned that audio option off. The only other awkward bits was during a select few cutscenes when the player can choose how to respond, and these aren't threaded very well, so there's sloppy edits and stuff of that sort. It made the cutscenes jarring in its presentation, but it's nothing that ruins the game. It just stands out and highlights the fact that this is a budgeted remake of an older budgeted title. At one point, even some NPCs who shouldn't have been in the cutscene also got glitched in, so that happened. Besides that, there's not a whole lot left to explain. There's a few goodies inside the mothership. Here you can not only upgrade your character or flying saucer, but there's an art gallery that I got a kick out of browsing. And there's even additional character skins to change into. There's only five and it'd be cool if there were a few more, but I'll take what I can get. Within the mothership, you can also replay missions and complete optional objectives you may have missed the first time around. And yeah, that's pretty much the game. Being from 2005, it's not overly complex. As a remake, I think it did a fine job. I had fun playing it and I appreciated the 2005 era throwback. Personally, I didn't like the voice acting of Crypto. It's original to the, well, original game. So this wasn't a choice made for the remake, but he mimics Jack Nicholson and I don't know, it just didn't do it for me. But I'm not gonna ding the game for that because it's such a particular thing and I'm sure lots of people will love it. Or if they remember the original game, they probably already do. So yeah, that's Destroy All Humans. It's a solid remake I enjoyed my time with. It's got some problems, but for a $30 game that's a remake of a game from 2005, I'm not really gonna fault it. So seven out of 10. If you're looking for a throwback, it's worth your money. But if you're not looking for a throwback and you're a bit more picky when it comes to older game designs, then realistically this one won't be for you. Oh, you can also look up this chick's skirt, so if you're a perv, 10 out of 10.